Drinks, jokes, and storytelling. I'm your host, Mark Riccadonna, and with me as always, Richie Byrne. Well, we got a great show today, man. We do. I'm so excited for our guest. Uh, we had him on before, but mm-hmm. it was during the pandemic. I don't know if you remember that, Richie. We I do. In, uh, we were in that weird studio where Sebastian, yeah, uh, Sebastian Bach drew penises all over. Yeah, I remember that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, that's a long time ago. That's right. <laughs> Did you recognize it? <laughs> he, the weirdest part is he traced them. He wasn't just drawing them. <laughs> Folks, Paul Provenza is with us. Yes. I'm Hello, with you. Hang on a second. There's a knock at my door. Hang on a second. I gotta go get that. <laughs> oh, oh, it's a six year old boy. He just showed up. <laughs> it's Paul's best friend. <laughs> now we got to tell the story. <laughs> so uh, Friday, I'm in New Mexico uh, doing a, the Tota Theater in beautiful Farmington. See, look at me plugging. Um, <laughs> and uh, I get a phone call. My six-year-old boy uh, forged a note and talked his way onto a bus and off of a bus. He talked his way through uh, three adults. <sighs> And ended up on a bus. I would use I would use the term adults months. loosely at this point. <laughs> I mean, he's six. Six. You know what's amazing is we never really talk about the kids who want to be human trafficked. <laughs> <laughs> we never really talk about that. We'll edit that out in post. <laughs> That was really funny. God. <laughs> the, oh my God. Well, I know, you know, I never saw an Amber Alert about him because I masturbate to those and I didn't see a single, <laughs> a single one. He's six years old, people. The kid is six years old. He, for, he went to the computer and forged a note saying that his parents said it was okay for him to get on this bus. And he just slept halfway across town. He's wow. six years old. This is going to be trouble. Everybody needs to have a photograph of this kid yeah. <laughs> on hand at all times. I, I don't and know. I, it's pretty impressive. It, I, mean, I In a twisted way, yes. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to worry about him having initiative, apparently. <laughs> Jesus. I told the comic I was working with, I go, you ever see the movie Catch Me If You Can? I'm living it. <laughs> <laughs> you're Tom Hanks. <laughs> I concur. Wasn't that the big line in that movie? What? How what? long was it before you had any idea where he was? So I guess he was. He was. He wasn't missing too long because a parent found him. But he got off the bus and then just went to somebody's house and started playing on their in their backyard. Oh, was it a stranger? That would be and, really. And, <laughs> uh, 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 he he did know the 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 house. He knew. He knew which house he wanted to go to. Was there anybody there when he started playing? Was no, I there? Don't know. I, yeah, the, so the parents were gone, but the grandparent the the grandparents were there, and they were like, "Who's this kid?" And he went out, and she started talking to him, and then they said, "Oh, that's that's Duke." And uh, you know, I guess from there, uh, they contacted the school who was trying to figure out where the hell he was. And, uh, yeah, they took him back to school, and my wife had to leave her job and go and pick him up from his aftercare thing. So it was, uh, yeah. And needless to say, I, I grade quite a bit this weekend. Wow. And, uh, and the thing was is he didn't think he did anything wrong. Like yeah. when we oh, talked man. to him, it was like, why did you get on that bus? He goes, well, I had a note. 
And we're like, who who wrote you the note? He goes, I did. <laughs> so I guess that's what he just thought he could do. Was he that was was there a signature <laughs> note? Did he try and forge your signature? He's six, he can't even write his own name. Yeah. I, <laughs> I it is weird, be, Mark, because it does. There is a part of you that should be proud of him. Yeah, I mean, you I know, know, aside from, I mean, no, yeah, aside from criminal negligence, you know, <laughs> and uh, all, all that stuff that you should be but, locked up for. I mean, Al, I'm sure Al Capone's father was proud of him. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> <laughs> so, well, then here's what here's what is funny. So we're trying to figure out how do we scare this kid. And the knowing what he did was so wrong, you know. Yeah, like he yeah. felt bad about it after we talked to him. But we were at the park yesterday. <laughs> after both the boys team arrived, he felt bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're at the park, and uh, a cop is walking through the park, and he comes over and asks if I saw the certain guy because there was a guy that was uh, he had a golf club or, or something. So somebody called a cop, but it was no big deal. Um. But I talked to the cop. The kids were in the park on the baseball field trying to fly a kite. And then when the cop left, I go, hey, Duke, cop was asking about you. And he was like, <laughs> really? And he got real nervous and really scared. I'm like, yeah, they heard all about you and what happened. So, uh, you know, you, <laughs> so they're watching you. So let me get this straight. Your son got on a bus because he illegally wrote a note. That like he pretended that it was you or whatever to, that it was okay, and your way of yeah. handling it was to lie to him back about a cop. Fight well, fire with fire. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta ask, start asking questions about the bus driver who got this note and went. Yes. That's okay. That's yeah, I agree with Paul. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. That's our. That's our. Uh, the, um, the call might come at any time because we emailed the uh, the school and the principal was, wasn't in school on Thursday and Friday. So we got waiting on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I hate to say it, but Paul's right. I mean, was it a, it was just a it was just a city bus or what kind of bus was it? Was it a no, no, no. It was a school bus. It was school a bus. school bus. <laughs> Yeah, you, this guy's oh. got to get fired. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. You gotta fire no, I, gotta you. From I got I got my hats all chipped, so you might want to think about. You know. <laughs> we got him a bracelet. If lost, please return. Holler, holler, <laughs> Duke. <laughs> Perfect name for someone with a collar and a dog tag. Herman Shepherd. Wow. I can't believe you can laugh about it. I, I think my head would still be exploding. Yeah. Ah, you Dude, I was in New Mexico. I had zero. You realize how helpless you are as a parent that does comedy? I, I had nothing. I couldn't do a thing. Even if I left. You don't blame it on comedy, Mark. You're helpless. <laughs> Even if I. Richie's just saying that because he's unemployed right now. He's not <laughs> and, working. And I'm not a parent. <laughs> so he's... Richie, I'm surprised I haven't seen you at the meetings. At the what? You broke up. <laughs> the meetings. The meetings? Yeah, Paul, you know. You know, Paul. I know. It's been a great three years. Um, I know, but I can, at least I can raise my head every morning and know that I'm not a negligent parent. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, this has been the most uplifting drink stories. Now, now, now Mark, did you, did you guys ever know he was missing, or by the time they contacted you? By the time they contacted because they called my phone, but I was at a sound check, so my phone. Oh well, the priority desk. sound check. Well, yeah, because I figured my kid was going to jump on a bus. Screw and my so kid! I got a. I, I got Purposely left the phone in the dressing room <laughs> during a sound check. Um, but, You're going to have to get so this kid a car. 
<laughs> he probably already knows how to hotwire him. <laughs> he might. He might. What does this kid watch? What kind of video games does he play? Let's really nail this I mean, down. He's six. So, all right. So, who contacts? Uh, he so plays like Mario and stuff. He's a very sweet kid. I mean, like he's you know he's a he just wanted to play with his friend and he found an opportunity and took it. Wow. So he wrote a note. I, is there any chance you could get the note and we can bring it on a future um, podcast? I'll because I, it was on his computer, so I'm sure there's a way to find it. And he printed it out. Oh, I think so. I think that's what ended up. But he said he never even had to show the note because he talked his way into everything. <laughs> he had so much confidence that he talked his way into it. That's how you got in the comic strip. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> He's the wow. next George Santos. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, am I proud. Rising star. <laughs> wow. <laughs> me. Yeah. So, uh, I just think it's... Weekend. We've had some really bad guests on this show, and today we have a great one, and somehow your son is way more compelling than Paul Provenza. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't make up that story. That's a fucking amazing story. <laughs> And and you're right, Rich. It is kind of like you kind of got to be proud. Yes, yeah. he, he accomplished it. He accomplished it without you know becoming part of Boko Haram. He got away. With it. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out some kids should be locked in cages. It turns out. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we can all laugh. I'm glad that we can all laugh about it. Seriously, I mean. Yeah, thank like, God. I mean. Yeah, I, there were so many opportunities. So many opportunities for that to have went really badly. Uh, luckily, everything's good, and he uh, he he did, now he's starting to realize what he did and how bad it was because no one knew where he was. But when they first started asking him, I guess he was pretty much like. Yeah, I could have just stayed at the guy's house. It's fine. <laughs> like he had no worry that he was in danger, that there was trouble that could have happened. So when he so when he got well, to the, rarely, when when he got to his friend's house, he did did he come into contact with the parents or he just like went into the backyard and so there was nobody even aware. At he got house. off the bus and just walked over to the backyard and then immediately they knew something was Was, was he with the friend or was he I'm I'm confused. Yeah, what? but they went to their house. Like I think there was a whole, a whole like uh, plan, but I think my son's probably taking the the brunt of the blame because oh, the wow. other kids just go. I just went home. Yeah, see, this is <laughs> this is why you're a bad parent, right there. It's uh, no question about it. This is gonna, this will come up in a trial. No, it's not my son's <laughs> fault. It's all the other kids. <laughs> who that kid who lived there went home. What an asshole. Hey, I, uh, what do you want me to do? Throw him under the bus here? And- ah, you see what you did there? <laughs> you're looking at him now, eminent horn. Uh, <laughs> man, that is a great story. <laughs> it just did you, you ask me what I did this weekend, Mark? I'm sorry. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was trying to ask you, Richie. Uh, how was your weekend? It was li- really it was weird. My, my horrible parenting. My father has dementia, and he left the house, and no one knew where he went. It was crazy. I spent a week just driving the bus. He was probably hanging out with Duke. <laughs> driving the bus around, you know, giving people lists. Picking up kids. I like to do that once. <laughs> you're, a, you're a giver. You're a giver, Paul. <laughs> this is the part of the show where we beat a horse with a dead horse. <laughs> Dude, I, I may never spend any time with you without talking about No, this. yeah, it's going to be tough. <laughs> it's going to be really tough. I've already. I've been. I've been texting everybody. Will ever tell anybody about Mark Rickabell? Uh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, I don't know if we can follow this. That, no, this might be the end of the show. Yeah, really. So, Paul, how's your career going? Uh, well, uh, you know, my career is a lot like randomly getting on buses. I just have no <laughs> idea where it's going. <laughs> What's going to happen to me if anybody knows I'm gone? 
It's a lot. <laughs> it turns out the story's a, like a parable for me. <laughs> 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 it's a letter from the from the uh, Ambulerinians to the disciples. <laughs> Two boarded a bus. <laughs> it's a it's a lesson teaching. Wow, I, I'm overwhelmed by this story. I'm sorry, it really threw me. The more the more you <laughs> talk, the more I was like, this kid is six. <laughs> I mean, this kid should run for president. We already had a con man. I think. Uh... <laughs> wow. wow. Uh, is he the oldest or the youngest? Uh, youngest. Youngest. How old's the older one? You have one or youngest. two? How many kids do you have? I can't keep track of your sperm. <laughs> God knows you try. <laughs> How many He's kids do you have? The older one's uh, right. eight. Oh my God, he's 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 talking like Megan with a glitch. Big guy cut out almost <laughs> everything. Are you there? <laughs> That's exactly what he sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> Megan with a glitch. Uh, that was really funny. <laughs> and you know, it's, when we lose him, it's the most interesting he is. <laughs> we have to keep that. <laughs> Well, he must be going off and coming back on, right? He he has to know he's frozen, right? Yeah, I would think so. Paul, where are you? I what? am in Los Angeles. Okay. How's which it? now weather of England? What? Oh, really? Is it foggy? Oh my god, the weather here is like it's like for the past couple of weeks it's been insane every day in a different way. The other day it was brutally hot and the sun was intense and then all of a sudden it rained for two days and now it's been cloudy for two days and I don't even know what the fuck is going on anymore. How long you been living in L.A.? Uh, well, I moved here in 1980, but, you know, until like the last until like about 15 years ago, I was almost never here. <laughs> right. 1980, really? Because you were yeah. you were in New York a lot back in the eighties. I remember, uh, you know, seeing. I wasn't in the business yet, but I remember your name and I saw you in Only Kidding. No shit. You were phenomenal. Oh, thank you, you were really good. That goes back, I think, a hundred years. Yeah, I, it, 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 ago. it was. Yeah, it was a while back. But you were tremendous in that. Who was the actor you were working with? I don't. I don't remember. It's so funny that you bring that up because I hadn't seen him in forever and then pandemic hit when we had plans to get together and we didn't and blah, blah, blah. His name is Andrew Hill Newman and I just saw him just the other day for the first time in a million years. He has to be pretty old now. Fuck you. He's my age. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you're right. <laughs> wow. No, you guys were wonderful together. I real. I mean... No, he I he, he was he didn't originate that role. Some uh, he came in and replaced somebody. Um, uh, originally, the role was played by Ethan Phillips, who's an actor who appears in so many things. I right, mean, he was in Star Trek. Uh, I don't know if he was on a series or a movie or whatever, but he left to do some other work. And so, because we had already been up and running, I was involved in casting the guy who was going to play my comedy partner. And Andrew walked in and. Within minutes, I was just like, this is the guy. This is the guy. And we had a, an incredible chemistry together. It's, it's one of those things that, you know, you wish happened all the yeah, time. But, but So Ethan Phillips was play, had to be playing older because he's not that old. Uh, right? The guy was supposed to be in his, like, 40s and 50s, right? And you were in your 20s. Uh, uh, no, no, we were, in a, we, we were supposed to be in our 20s. I thought he was in – why do I – I don't know why, but I thought well, he was an older comic. There was more – there were four, five characters. It was me and Andrew who were comedy. Oh, okay. That's what it was. It was the young comedy writer and the old guy who's Larry Keith. Right. The old comedy stalwart who was, you know, bringing in this young writer to help him out. Right. That's who I was thinking and, of. And then there was the guy, the, the guy who managed the comedy team who was all mobbed up. Right. His name was Zap. He was, he's phenomenal. He's still, he's still working. I mean, that, that was really what, I really thought I've seen a lot of obviously we want films and everything about comedy and they're usually horrendous. They usually don't 
fit at all. But I, I felt that was a really good depiction of comedy. I thought it was too. Yeah. And um, well, it was written by Jim Gagan, who was uh, I originally met as part of a comedy team when I was starting out in the New York Improv. Okay. Uh, so he really knew his shit. You know, it's I, it's dated now because uh, yeah. You know, as soon as, it's so funny how now movies are being set in like 1989 because they can't deal with cell phones or the whole plots are destroyed. You yeah. Know? Yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. It's true. It's really, uh, it's really changed uh, the comedy scene, obviously. So it's a little bit dated, but uh, you know, it's still, it's still the characters are still around. We still see those characters yes. all the time. Yeah. The world. Uh, but here's an interesting thing: the the play was really it was so highly regarded um, when it was running in New York, and I also did a national tour of it for a little while. Well, not national, but a few cities, um, and. Um, uh, there was very, very serious interest in optioning for a movie by mm -hmm. guess who the fuck wanted to wanted to write the screenplay and direct the movie. Guess who the fuck was calling about doing this play as a movie? Billy Wilder. Really? What? Yes. Yes. Wow. And, you know, when I was talking to Jim Gagan about it, he was like, I, I, I can't. It, it's like. I can't believe it, you know. Um, but Jim's a great writer. He's written TV for decades and decades yeah. and decades. Um, created some, you know, shows. I, I think he was one of the, one of the uh, original producers of like uh, Zach and Cody. He did a bunch of stuff with Disney. Um, he's a he's a hardcore serious writer, uh, funny and sharp, and uh, yeah. And Billy Wilder, they negotiated for quite a while. Wow. And at one point, Jackie Mason was interested in doing the role of the, role. the older, the older out of touch comic. Oh. So you know, put that in the with all the other things that could have happened but didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so big. But uh, wow, no, thank you. I haven't, I haven't thought about that. Uh, yeah, I know it's, it, but I'll never forget. I remember seeing it. I wasn't even a comic yet. And uh, a buddy of mine from college said, I got these tickets to this play. You want to go? And I went and, and I knew your name. I knew Paul. And I was just blown away by how great you were in that. Well, Andrew Hill Newman, who we were talking about, played, played comedy mm -hmm. partners with me. Uh, just our chemistry was phenomenal. Like, he mm -hmm. walked in within minutes. I was like, please, please make it be this guy because we can play. Yeah. And we ended up ad living a lot of stuff that that ended up in the script that gave it that vibe of really of like two comics, you know, right. riffing stuff. It was fun. It was right. fun. Cool. Mark, you back? Yes, I'm back. All right. Thank God. Are you? Where'd you go? Would you get on a bus yeah. and go somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> I had to go to my Are friend's okay? house the Wi Fi. <laughs> the funny thing is, help. if Mark got on a bus, the bus driver would go, Whoa, whoa, what are you doing? Hey, hey, hey. Hey. hey why isn't anyone with you? <laughs> where's where's your six year old son? <laughs> I dude, I told Angie when you said about uh, my kids already outgrew my sense of humor. She oh, me laughed so hard. It's true. It's true. I used to watch videos of you with your kids, and you'd be doing your your humor, and they thought it was the greatest thing ever. And like two years later, they were like, "Wow, this guy is hack." <laughs> <laughs> Go under the fart joke. Huh? Another Go fart the joke. <laughs> Oh shit! Oh man, that's brutal. Um, you know, and when Gilbert uh, had his second baby, uh, I hadn't even met the first one yet, and I flew him out to L.A. to do a taping. And um, uh, I said to Gilbert, "I go, uh, you got a new baby? It's great. You know, how are you feeling? How is? Because Gilbert, as a father, is kind of a scary thought, yes. except when." really process it you realize oh no he like probably relates to his kids yeah you know which was true he had a phenomenal relationship but everybody said uh i said at one point i go uh gilbert uh, are they funny? and he goes ah, i prefer the earlier work <laughs> 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 oh my god it's so good <laughs> <laughs> he clicked with my kids, man. I was on the road with him, and my kids were with me. And Andy and uh, I said, "Hey, man, do you mind uh, 
<laughs> the funny part is, is I think he was a little thrown off. Because I go, my my older son really wants to meet you. And he thought it was because of Aladdin. Right. He's never seen Aladdin. <laughs> we wow. just used to call Axel, we used to call him Gilbert. Because he, <laughs> he would do the faces and he would walk and he looked like Gilbert, real like, you know, like zero muscle tone. And he... When he wanted a hug, he would do the. <laughs> and so I used to call him Gilbert. And then when I was on the road with Gilbert, I was like, You want to come meet your real dad? <laughs> <laughs> and they just, we went out to eat and he talked to them and he was so good with them and he was just so nice. And then uh, at the end of the weekend, I went to help him pack it to a car because he had a all these huge suitcases and stuff. And um, he's like, your kids aren't coming down. Like we hung you out know, all that, weekend. They're not going to bring your kids. The same that, that makes, Cause he really was just a big old grown kid his whole life. It's just a child. <laughs> you know, what, um, a great, what a great guy. I miss Gilbert. It's so sad. Yeah. All right. Mm. Anyway. Okay. What else uplifting are we going to talk about? <laughs> Oh my God! I uh... so, so, you know who has cancer? Come on, let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I think uh, anybody that makes a Bud Light joke is immediately put in a hack file now. <laughs> it's right up there with the my pronouns are dot 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 joke. <laughs> yeah, I, if I hear any like, it was like it had two weeks. To live, and now it's like, all right, enough. We've heard them all. <laughs> That's so funny. It's a young comic. I said, you know, Bud Light is the new airplane. <laughs> 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 that is true when you're an old comic, too, because you'd rather drink on the flight than eat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> what, 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 um, show were you in with Paul Mark? What? You said you shot a pilot. Radio Gods. Uh, oh, Paul pilot. was in Radio Gods. That's right. How can I? I forget yeah. that. Radio Gods with Rick Overton. God, yes. How can I forget that? Was so damn funny. I want to put it in a, another screening somewhere just because it needs to be seen. You guys Growing up in Philly, I learned three things. Only tourists run up the stairs. They can't arrest us all. And Philly loved the shock jock duo, morning radio show, The Radio Gods. Mainly the dumb drunk people. But it didn't matter though, it was the 90s and the gods were the dudes. First of all, I just want to say my father was a big fan. Well, your father is a man of taste. Tell Pop we're a big fan of his too. He was very abusive. Toughen up. Times are changing, and the radio gods found themselves in a new world. A woke world. So, we're old and irrelevant, is that what you're saying? I said you're not fired, and you're not. You're suspended. Suspended? What, 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 what does that mean, suspended? Yeah, mean? you get to be the bad guys. We're gonna say that you're in breach of your contract, and we're gonna suspend you for the remainder of your contract. But you're not fired. You don't want to fire Brian because the kid's going to end up on the pole. They tried everything to keep relevant. New jobs. God damn, either this fucking suit is giving me a wedgie or the oak is still in it. Time with family. Listen, if I help you, do you promise to never talk around my friends? They already have a nickname for you. Have we got a nickname for me? Well, what's my street name? You can tell me. What is it? Come on, the rhino needs to know. Peter Bedpan, okay? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Until they finally came up with an idea. People now listen to streaming podcasts. A podcast. Let's do a podcast. That's right, a podcast. Because it's 2021, and by now, everybody has one. I don't even know what that is, but I love it. There's big bucks behind this one. Their longtime sponsor, Big Tom from the South Jersey Auto Group. And there's also Big Tom's daughter, Maggie. 
times change. Yeah, she hates them. So join Max, Rhino, and their useless producer Skippy as the radio gods make their rise back from the dead all the way to slightly better than dead. What if their slogan is, the gods are dead, uncut, uncensored, unemployed? Oh, this is bullshit! You guys were just so funny. You are. Everything you guys were you great. Guys did was all right. Run through the cast. Let's talk about all the comics that. Came yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, since we started, when we were talking about Gilbert, Gilbert was supposed to be uh, Big Tom, but he couldn't do it because he got ill, and uh, so we ended up getting Tony V, who amazing comic out of Boston. Yeah. Uh, Good too. Good actor too. Yeah, uh, so good. He's a really good actor too. Uh, uh, I remember Richie Voss is Voss in was in it. Fugel Voss. sang. Fugel sang. Uh, yeah. Tom Tata. Tom. Right. There's so many Cotter. We had Cotter. Um, and uh, who else was there? God, there were so many great guys in that. John uh, uh, um, Don Jameson also. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I wasn't in it. I wasn't in it, Tony. Why not? Uh, uh, no one asked me. Uh, I'm sorry. It went nowhere. You should have been. I kept getting. Here's what I was told. I was told, dude, when this gets picked up, there's a great role for you. There is. You were going to be the janitor. <laughs> we couldn't write him in in the pilot. <laughs> well, you could because there was never any going to be. There's no other shows. <laughs> Richie, you've been in every goddamn thing I've ever made I know. since. I know, and I always have to have a dialect. Yeah, I make Richie always have some kind of accent. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can see how they propelled his career. <laughs> <laughs> what, what all the agents and managers in Hollywood talk about is you got to get in a Rick Adana project. Yes. <laughs> it's a, look, it, it will fill your afternoon. That's the only guarantee I can make. <laughs> <laughs> people, do, uh, the, does, do the people uh, both of them that watch this podcast um, <laughs> do they know how many how many movies you've been produced that you've produced or been involved with uh, no I don't I, usually you know we don't talk too much about that but yeah if, uh, do they know about the horror movie that you did what yeah, was that I called know. I came to the screening of what was that called oh uh, uh, Days of Power we're the ones looking for the Chihuahua Oh, yes, yes. Come on in. Days of Power, about the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the farm. Yeah, there's the Southern yeah. con men, and they abducted a bunch of uh, pop stars. Right, 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 right. Yeah, <laughs> that was amazing. He's actually produced real bona fide movies yeah <laughs> the uh yeah. he's actually, he's being really nice to you right now mark i know it's the guy who made the aristocrats i mean come on i know no I he know. showed up with a letter <laughs> that is you know now that he you know they he's right him, they let him produce this movie now that i think about it i went to lunch with uh, uh an agent the other day and mark's name came up and the agent said there is nobody who is more has more like gumption than Mark Riccadonna. And he's Mark Riccadonna will go anywhere and do anything just to be involved in the movie, the TV show, the play, whatever it is. He never and I'm and I'm thinking about it, I'm like, that's kind of what your son did. Yeah. That's where I was, that's where I was going with this. It's clearly a genetic influence here. <laughs> no, you are one of those guys who you just want something to happen and you just keep keep pushing and pushing and yeah. do all that together and you make it happen. It's actually kind of remarkable, you know, regardless of the fact that it ends up being a waste of time and money. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's most of show business anyway. You know, that's most it's right. Business. It is most of show business. People don't realize <laughs> that. <laughs> if, any, if any industry had the failure to success ratio of television pilots, it, yeah. it would, would have folded decades ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it is amazing I, how much time you waste working on projects and things, you know, like that you, you think are going to, you know, just anything, 
even acting, you sit like when you're at a TV show or something, you just sit there for like three hours and they go, all right, we need you for 20 minutes. All right. <laughs> I'm actually, uh, we just talking about things that just keep pushing. We're going out to the World Series of Poker to screen a pilot that I was in. And uh, Dan Loria was in it, Tony Dennison. And uh, um, it's all about poker. And this is how dumb I am. I got casted, and they had to hire somebody to come teach me how to play poker. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, if this makes you feel any better, I did a failed pilot about po poker players as well. Did you really? <laughs> yeah, it was starring uh, D uh, Daniel Baldwin and uh, a bunch of people, and I was one of like the core of uh, poker playing guys. So, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> Uh, Paul, can I tell you that I met the director of this sitcom, and he said that if it gets picked up, he's going to put me in it. So I'm, I'm, I'm always the bridesmaid, never the bride. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, Richie, because nobody wants to waste your time. He said to me, if I if this gets picked up, I'm putting you in. I go or in the business, we call that a Riccadonna. <laughs> <laughs> At least I have a term. There's a term about me. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's negative. I'm just happy. I got <laughs> what are you working on now? You must be have. You must have another pilot or movie. Yes, that you're he does. Always. <laughs> it, no, it's really. I mean, I'm making fun of everything, but but um, <laughs> no, it's really quite remarkable. I have another friend who's like that. His name is Lance Michio, and he's a brilliant guy. He's a painter and uh, a writer and uh he he just he'll like tell me about an idea he has for a movie a couple of weeks later he'll send me a script i'll read the script and then like in a year uh, you know the fucking thing's having a screening like, how do you do this it's amazing he just puts together elements and uh, you know uh, i guess there's you know there's enough of us who are just like let's just do what we do you know and they they get together and do projects and maybe they click maybe they don't like that's probably most of of, of the you know non-stars and show business in any field you know but um uh, i'm constantly amazed at how he actually envisions projects and gets them made i might yeah. have to do this yeah. constant fight all the time you know in my experience i so little comes to fruition from every idea you pitch you know yeah yeah we did um a series of sketches and richie you were in it <laughs> called checked out and uh richie does an irish accent in it no scottish yeah, scottish uh, uh, yeah irish, I irish was the movie that you put me in that isn't going anywhere either <laughs> <laughs> but we checked out we're but, trying but to it's get a it very inspiring episode I just <laughs> <laughs> this is the episode you watch before you kill yourself yeah well me in a kilt <laughs> yes <laughs> I remember when I first started first started studying acting, uh, I read a book called Acting Professionally, a small little book, but it was like, you know, the, the sort of like uh, what to expect when you go into acting. Is thing. And the first chapter is all about how you will be a failure, that you will yeah. not make a <laughs> <laughs> of, you know, members of the uh, acting union and, work, and then who makes above a certain amount each year. And it's like, you know, 0.001% make above a living wage, you wow. know, yeah. uh, uh, and all that sort of stuff. And I thought to myself, that is the perfect way to start a book about yeah. especially. <laughs> it was one of the most depressing things. And actually, it says at one point, it says, if you still want to continue, go on to chapter two. Yeah. <laughs> but this, is the book, this is a book every act needs. <laughs> the most important chapter in this book is chapter 11. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was good, Mark. That was good. <laughs> Paul, were your aspirations to be an actor first or a comic first? Uh, uh, definitely a comic first, but but you know I started doing comedy when I was sixteen. Is when I first uh, God, went on Jesus. to the improv. Uh, and well, you know what's really fucked up is when I started hanging out at the improv. I started going there as a as a kid. I started going there at like fifteen. You know, yeah. just to see comedy. And um, back then in the seventies. Apparently, they didn't really check ID because <laughs> I, I was 15 with a couple of friends of mine throwing back tequila sunrises and seeing people like, you know, Franken and Davis and Gilbert wow. Gottfried and, wow. and, and uh, uh, um, uh, Larry David. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Paul, if you needed a fake ID, I know a kid. <laughs> the time you didn't need him bud friedman i, I could sell a drink and fuck it you know yeah uh, <laughs> they, they, didn't, they didn't care and uh i guess they figured if you were there you must have had a note so uh, uh i used to go all the time and i saw all of these people really early on in their careers Lane boozler um, I remember going to catch and seeing Richard Belzer and, and all of us, you know, like my head exploding. Uh, oh, the best MC that ever motherfucking lived. Wow. Yeah. Everybody says that. I he was the host of the shows. He, he was like the house MC at Catch a Rising right. Star. And, and in fact, when I had him on the green room, I actually told him the story that he banned me from Catch a Rising Star. It was like two years. I didn't get to work at Catch a Rising Star because he banned me. Why? No, did, why? Well, and he said, "And he said, when was this?" And I was like, eh, "Mid seventies." He goes, "Oh yeah, that, I, I, I wasn't. Uh, you can't hold me accountable for anything that happened back then." <laughs> <laughs> Did he ban you be- from coming in the club as an as a patron, or were you doing comedy and he didn't like something you did on stage? Yeah, I went on stage, and uh, we're talking. This must have been seventy. Let's see, I graduated from high school in seventy five, so this must have been seventy three or seventy four. I was real young when I started. I really, yeah, when I from wanting to be a comedian at around the age of eight, knowing that that was a very specific yeah. art form. Because I used to watch my grandmother. My grandmother used to love the Ed Sullivan Show, and you know we'd spend Sunday, have dinner, and then all sit around and watch the Ed Sullivan Show. And I remember being very clear about the stand-up comic on the show. You know that that's I want to do that. A whole room full of people listening to what you have to say. <laughs> Holy who, shit! Who was the first comic you clearly can picture? Like that you clearly, because like there's all these like I remember watching comedy with my grandma, but who was the first one that you clearly were like? I specifically remember that guy. Well, I mean, like the first like comic influence that I ever had, which is I think true for an entire couple of generations was not stand up it was bugs bunny good one uh, no you're right yeah, you know cuz bugs bunny those cartoons were made for adults mm-hmm. they were shown in movie theaters along with you know screwball comedies and stuff uh and uh so there's a re- really sly aspect mm-hmm. to them They're, they weren't kids cartoons even though kids loved them they weren't made for kids mm-hmm. and um um and all the people behind them come from a rich tradition in like vaudeville and sketch comedy and radio comedy, you know? And so when you watch, when you, you know, as a kid watching Bugs Bunny, I, I was getting the training of, of, of classic comedy, you know? And um, uh, so Great he was like the first real uh, identifiable, clear comic character that I remember seeing, you know? Wow, and then as as stand up, uh, I, I don't remember, but I, you know, the weird, the other weird thing about growing up in the seventies is that TV was more inclusive in in terms of generations. Like, you know, if you remember in the seventies, watching Freddie Prinze on the Mike Douglas show, but he was also on the show with Jack Benny or Groucho Marx, you know. Or, or um, you know, the, on the Tonight Show, you could see somebody like uh, Charlie Callis on the bill with Richard Pryor. You know, and so you wow. got a real expansive view of old comedy and new hip young comedy. You know, um, you, you don't see that anymore. Now it's all yeah. about demographics and their, you know, who they're trying to appeal to as a as a, as, a, as a group. But but. Um, uh, at the time, it was, you know, so I, I think our generation might be the, or the generation after me, maybe, were probably the last generation where if you just turned on TV, you could actually see a breadth of, of comedy. That's a from great different point. Era, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I mean, you know, Milton Berle was still working, Phyllis mm-hmm. Diller was still working, you know, all those people were there along with the Elaine Boozlers and the, and the Freddie Princes and the Cheeches and Chugs, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even if you even if you remember like with laughing, they had that hip sixties early seventies way about them, but they were still using Ruth Buzzy and you know right. like, exactly. you know what I'm Joanne exactly. Worley and stuff like that and people who were yeah. kind of you know that old school way. 
Yeah. So, you know, it was it was a real uh, buffet of comic influences mm-hmm. and history that you were exposed to without even trying. You know, if you just watched the talk show, you would see that, you know, but that, it's really weird. Like people don't get that. Like the Mike Douglas show would have like John Lennon yep. and Gore Vidal on the same yeah. episode. You know, <laughs> like, that. like, yeah, so fucking interesting, especially now in retrospect, I look at it and I just go, wow, that just doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. You know? Um, so I did have all those influences. And then, of course, the Ed Sullivan show where you could see a Richard Pryor and a Jackie Mason on the same show, you know. Right. Uh, um, so I remember all of those. I mean, one of the, uh, the first uh, live action comedian in movies that I related to was Jerry Lewis, because I had what what's called lazy eye it was called amblyopia. Uh, and I one one eye was stronger than the other. And so when I was starting from about the age of six, maybe I, I I had surgery on my eye when I was like eight and I had to wear eye patches and I had to do all of these optical exercises with these weird little setup machines where it focused one thing on one side, another thing on the other side. Yeah. And I had the eyeglasses since I was like six years old. And, and, um, but so because I had this amblyopia, lazy eye, one eye working more than the other, I didn't really have depth perception because I was only using predominantly one eye. Uh, so I was all my depth perception was learned. Like if there were two glasses on a table and one was in front of the other, I, I, I just kind of had an experience of, oh, I think that one's about here relative to the wow. other one. It was not really clear. To this day, still... Uh, if it's why I, I can't play pool. If I sit down and I if, if I try to line up a shot in pool, I see two of everything. Wow, that's because um, you're uh, drunk. But go on. Should be. <laughs> I should be. I could drop you to drink. But so that was a big part of my childhood was was bumping into things, spilling things, knocking things over. I would be turning around a corner and clip my own glasses with the corner. They wow. would break. My parents would get pissed at me because I broke another pair of glasses and my mother's insurance wouldn't cover more than, you know, one pair every two years or whatever the fuck it was. She was a, 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 a teacher. You know, teaches. But so eventually they would be like, well, we're not, you're just going to have to learn how to be more careful. So my entire childhood was some of the big, huge hunk of scotch tape on one. <laughs> one <story. laughs> and um, and my, my parents were, you know, my parents were really strict they were really severe and um uh it it didn't they didn't really show a lot of compassion or or maybe even understanding at the time that that this was a depth perception problem but i always get berated for knocking things down and bumping into things knocking things over and all that sort of shit and then uh i saw jerry lewis a jerry lewis movie i think it might have been the nutty professor uh, no, it was before that. It was way before that. Uh, and uh, he was a big movie star, and people loved him. And he was doing the same shit I was in trouble for. Bumping into things, knocking things over, being a klutz, all that sort of stuff. So I was like, okay, I got to make people enjoy the fact that I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really how it all started. Wow. I actually said, yeah. you know. Jerry Lewis was like, uh, like my role model. I'm like, okay, so if I fall down or I bump into something or I knock over a vase, uh, I'm just going to try and make it funny. And so I started doing shtick around all of it. And that's how, that's how I started doing comedy. Wow. That's crazy, man. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Weird. It, it was <laughs> Richie, do you have a first person you specifically remember seeing? Um, yeah, I, you know, I think it was Flip Wilson because, oh yeah, yeah. Boy, he was, he's somebody who I don't think, like, I, I think, I don't think anybody, you know, of a certain age ever even heard of him and he was yeah. so great yeah. and so important. He started, started that record label that, you know, gave us some of the biggest stars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just well, remember he, I was a kid. And I, I loved Flip Wilson and didn't think about it till I was older that that was probably, you know, I actually did, when I did my, I used to have a variety show in the city at Caroline's, Paul. And I remember that 
when and it was I had a band, we had a five piece band. I had actors who could sing who were in it, and it was a whole thing. It was a big production. I realized this all stemmed from watching Carol Burnett and Flip Wilson when I was eight years old. Oh wow! You know, right. and, and they and they belong in the same in the same uh, uh, sentence because they both were so extraordinarily good. Yeah. I so good and so rich. And you want to hear something wild? I um I interviewed uh, Marshall Warfield for a sure. thing I was doing uh, with my buddy Dan Pasternak uh, about the comedy Love. boom. Uh, and um, she said at one point she said, you know, the big, the strongest uh, comic influence. The first time, let me. I'm trying to re think how she put this, but basically it was that the first strong female role model in comedy that she ever saw was Geraldine was Flip Wilson. Wow. Wow. She was so funny. She's great. She's still working. Um, yeah. <laughs> Is she really? Wow. Yeah. Because yeah. it's, it's funny because, um, I didn't realize I'm doing my show for years. I'm doing this show and I always had a comic guest and Bill Burr did it. And when he got on stage, he said, I'm just up here for 10 minutes while Richie gets into another dress. Nah. And I didn't realize, I'm like, oh my God, I'm just doing the Flip Wilson show up here. Like, you know what I mean? That's what I was doing. I didn't even realize it. So you can get arrested in Florida now if you did that show. <laughs> <laughs> Richie would fit in though, because he doesn't like reading. <laughs> well, Flip Wilson was fucking great. Yeah. Fucking great. And I remember really, seeing him and... Seeing him and Go Richard ahead. Pryor together on his show was amazing, amazing. Yeah. You know, if you somebody, for, if there's know. anyone out there who doesn't know who we're talking about, go look him up on YouTube because he was tremendous. So mm. many good clips on uh, yeah. YouTube of Flip Wilson. They were like at the time, you know, like three of his catchphrases were like in the yeah. popular. Yeah, the devil made me buy this dress. Devil made me do it. Devil, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. You don't know me that well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he was huge. He was huge and, and deservedly so. Yeah. It's so weird that there are certain comics that don't get mentioned. They're like the oh yeah comics. That when you're talking about greats and you bring there's so many so many great comics that you, you bring up their name and people go, Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah well, you know, I, I've actually talked to young comics who's like, you know, uh I know about George Carlin, but they've never actually like listened to an album. It's crazy. Yeah. How do you get into this business and not totally be into the research of it? I know. So I said, I could be a musician and not know box work. What the fuck? You know, yeah. I don't care what kind of musician you are. That's a great sake. point. <laughs> I have a but, question. This is off the wall weird, but do you know a comedian named uh, Chip Chinnery? Yes, yes, yes. Wait, I just, I, I just bought his book. What's that? I just bought his book. What's Charging, it called? Charging Mount. And apparently he meticulously documented his first year on the road as a comic. And it's all about that. And, really? Uh, yeah. A guy named Mike Green up in Detroit. The, uh, he's a great headliner. He uh, runs the comedy club One Night Stands. And uh, he was telling me about him in the green room. I went online, found it, bought it online, and it just came in. So it's going to be my new road book. You know what else is a terrific, uh, terrific book about the history of comedy is uh, um, um, Wayne Fetterman's book. I think it's called Ooh. The History of Comedy. I love uh, Wayne Fetterman. It's a thin little volume, but it's so chock full of, like, you know, you get an overview of the history of comedy that is that is really, really terrific, and it reads so fast. I, really? I, I, yeah. I'm going to get it. That That's how it. I felt about uh, Scheidner's book. It read so fast, I actually got depressed because it was like, I'm almost done. Like, I'm almost done. I got to – maybe I should start over. <laughs> But that's a, so that's a that's a big thing. And it's like, you know, uh, it's a, there's a flip side to all of that. It's like, you know, I, I sort of decry. I mean, I think everybody should know, you know, George Carlin's work, obviously. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a little too obvious. But I mean, everybody should know Robert Klein. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, and he's somebody who I've become very friendly with in, in uh, recent
recent years. And uh, he was one of the biggest, he influenced our entire generation. You mm-hmm. know? I was going to say, he he's the, the first guy to really change from the Catskills to the city. Exactly. He, he, the way he puts it, he goes, you know, there was, um, uh, they were all World War II vets. And then all of a sudden, you know, there were young college educated people like Robert Klein. And he was the first guy to speak to that generation. Uh, wow. um, you know, post-immigrant, you know, mm-hmm. post-war, uh, um, educated, uh, um, articulate, you know, it wasn't mother-in-law jokes and, you know, it wasn't even joke jokes. It was more, you know, uh, on, on life as we actually know it. Um, and he's, you know, I mean, he's a maestro. He's one of the best. But, you know, Seinfeld, Billy Crystal, I, you go down the list of all the big names. They'll tell you Klein was one of the biggest influences because he was just the guy that, who you know, Robert Klein shows up. Alan King is already there. Who am I going to relate to, you know? Right. So an entire couple of generations. In fact, when I was starting out, people used to say that Larry Miller, myself, and Paul Reiser all sounded exactly the same. And it's because we were all doing Klein. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny you brought up Larry Miller. He's my guy that I remember seeing clear. Specifically, Larry Miller was the yeah. guy. I was watching The Tonight Show with my Aunt Mary on the couch. Wow. And I remember seeing Larry Miller. Full headed, full head of hair, Larry Miller. Yeah, full head of hair, Larry Miller, probably doing one of these. And he did, used to do something which was pretty remarkable at the time, which was his entire six minute spot might be one story, you know, like yeah. the the eating story or the um, uh, getting drunk and driving to Vegas story. You know, <laughs> they were all like, his entire set was one story for you know like a bunch of appearances. He, he was such a is such a craftsman but i remember back in those days thinking wow man i I hope someday i can be as you know good as that as as, as well crafted and well written and structured and it's it's unbelievable i mean it's you know the precision of larry's work was always so remarkable but it wasn't obvious it wasn't like set up punchline it was just amazing craftsmanship for six minutes you know yeah Mm -hmm. And a big, uh, he was a big influence on us. Uh, well, for me, on wanting to do this podcast, when uh, I talked to Richie about he should be doing a podcast, it was because I was listening to nonstop listening to Larry Miller, and yeah. he would tell these jokes, and he would tell jokes that I've heard a thousand times, you know, that my dad told at the dinner table, but he took it in his own direction and painted the picture his own way, and it was just like. I, I just loved it so much, and that was what influenced me to want to ask people to tell a joke on every episode because I think it's just cool to yeah. hear. Well, you know, um, I, I, the I, aristocrats when you talked about it as jazz, it was like, oh my god, this this is perfect sense. This makes perfect sense. Well, you know, there's uh, on the DVD of the aristocrats. If, I don't know if you remember DVDs. <laughs> uh, there's over three and a half hours of extras. Really? One, one of the extras is just a compendium of, uh, you know, we kept the camera running while we were hanging out with these people. And um, uh, so we put together a thing where they just tell other jokes. And it's like 20 people just telling these old jokes. You know, it's shot like shit because we weren't really shooting them. We just, yeah. just kept Yeah. Them. Wow. <laughs> But it's awesome. great, from Martin Mull to Amazing Jonathan to uh, uh, Paul Reiser. Um, <laughs> Martin Mull is the one. Great. I, got, I do have a great joke for you. And this is a joke that, yeah. that I got from Reiser. And, but it's a classic. It's one of the great all-time showbiz jokes. But it specifically kind of speaks to comedians. But but it's generally show business. And it's the guy working in the, uh, in the, uh, in the circus. <laughs> The new guy just hired, and they go, okay, you're the low man on the totem pole. you got to take the crappiest jobs. Your job is before the show, every night, you know, when the elephants take a big dump in the middle of the show, it, it, first of all, who's the audience? You know, the kids go crazy. Dancers come on. They slip. They fall. It's a big hazard. So we got to evacuate them before every show. So you take this big broom handle. 
and you just shove it up the elephant's asses right before they're going on, and that'll clear them out, and everything will be fine. <laughs> well, the guy goes to the uh, the youngest elephant, and he's shoving the pole up there, and it's a little hard, and the elephant's... <laughs> And he goes to the, you know, the elephant's mom and uh, uh, the baby elephant's mom and, and he shows it up and it goes, it goes in a little easier, but it's still a bit of a struggle. And the elephant is like stamping his foot and he pulls it out. He's there. Then he goes up to the old, you know, granddaddy elephant and he shows it up and it goes right in and the elephant turns around and he goes, how's the house? <laughs> <laughs> is, that perfect? is that a perfect show of his joke it is <laughs> guys that was paul thank you so much for being on guys that was drinks jokes and storytelling oh, is it my wi-fi i think yeah I, unfortunately i think it's you because every yeah you know, i got i got paul fine you know everything else is fine here so i unfortunately i think it's you i think your wi-fi took a bus to a friend's house <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs>